Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. We had a little technical glitch there that's thrown us slightly, um, but we're we're now here. We couldn't um, we couldn't find Jamie temporarily, but um, as you can all see, Jamie's Jamie's with us, which is um, great news. So thanks all for joining, um, especially given France are playing Portugal at the same time. I think we're expecting about 130 people. So. Uh, I think that's a, a great turnout. So um, thank you, Jamie. And welcome to the fifth webinar of our series. Um, the last one was with Ailey Barber and we're all looking forward to Scotland and how well they might do in the in the Euros. So um, I think we've probably had a lot of fun watching Scotland. Just a little bit disappointed them that they, they fell out last night, but I'm sure all the England fans on the call will be delighted. Um, England are still going well. So before we get underway, if I can ask you, please, to make sure you're on mute, just to make sure everybody's sound quality is, is good. Um, and I'm you know, sure it won't happen with this very educated bunch, but you want to avoid people getting asked to let the dog out and, and that kind of thing. So that would be good. Thank you. Um, Jamie will be a very familiar face to you, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, having followed his outstanding tennis career to date. Jamie's a seven-time Grand Slam doubles winner, Formal, former doubles world, world number one and a Davis Cup champion. So that's a pretty impressive trophy cabinet by, by anyone's standards. Um, Jamie's also a very keen golfer, plays at Dunblane and Wentworth, which, uh, which must be very, very nice, and is a keen Hibs and Man United fan. So I'm delighted to say, you know, we've got a crowd of over uh, 130, which is, which is great news. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Gordon Wilson, Managing Director of Carbon Financial Partners. So the plan for this evening, so you know, is to have a QA and a with Jamie for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll open the, open the floor to all of your own questions. Uh, and we'll aim to finish between 8.30 and 8.45. So please use the chat function and I'll pick up your questions through chat and I'll try and um, answer as, or ask Jamie as many of them as I, as I possibly can. So... Thanks for joining and um, we'll push on with the questions to, to Jamie. So, so Jamie, thank you for coming on. Um, I thought we might open with how your, how your year's been and what's it been like traveling through COVID with bubbles, what are the challenges and, and what's changed this year? Um, well, I mean, a lot has changed since the tour started up. Uh, last sort of August, September, and we went, our first tournament back was, was at the US Open after a sort of six month, uh, six month break. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it's, I mean, it's a completely different tour than what it used to be. Um, certainly in terms of like our, our freedom and what we're, what we can, what we can and can do. I mean, we're basically living in a bubble from, from week to week, um, you know, in a hotel room or at the tennis courts, that's it basically. Um, obviously getting, you know, COVID tested all the time, every sort of three days or four days, um, which is pretty stressful just on the basis that, you know, we're in a foreign country when we're doing all these tests. And if we happen to, to test positive, then we've got to obviously isolate in that hotel room for, you know, seven, 10, 21 days, depending on, on the country that you're, that you're in. Um, you know, some guys in Qatar at the start of the year were, were stuck in their hotel room for, for over three weeks. Um, I think also in Italy last September is the same thing. There was a guy stuck there for three weeks because they wouldn't let him leave until he, until he didn't test positive anymore. Um, so it's been, it's been difficult, been, been stressful, Obviously, it's not that much fun, or it hasn't been that much fun playing in front of, of no crowds, um, because you know for us that's what kind of makes it special is is getting out there and playing in, in full stadiums. It's the fans that that uh, that create the atmospheres for us to to play in. Um, so it's been it's been difficult. Um, it has been has been hard, but you know at the same time I think the tour has done an amazing job of keeping the tour going through these difficult times and, you know, still giving the players opportunities to, to compete and, and, and earn a living. And you've, you've, you touched on atmosphere there. So you're, you're at Wimbledon just now. 
is the atmosphere starting to build or is it you know is it the weekend or when when do things well I, i'm actually i'm in eastbourne just now um right. playing i wasn't supposed to be but we 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 lost in the first round at, at queen's um and decided wanted to play some more matches so um i'm, I'm in eastbourne we just won our match basically a couple hours ago actually we finished it at 5 30 um so we're here doing the last warm-up event and then we'll go to Wimbledon once we finish um I mean here is you know it's starting to get a bit better now because obviously there's more and more fans being allowed into the to the venues and obviously Wimbledon they announced last week will be minimum 50 percent and hopefully increasing through the tournament and I think they said full capacity for the for the finals which is um which is awesome so um it'll definitely feel more like um playing a proper proper tennis tournament I feel like it really matters because there'll be people there cheering for you and um, there should be a much a much better atmosphere so well done on your win today um how, how are you feeling form wise going into the tournament um so so i mean we had a good start to the year in um in australia we won the warm-up tournament and then um we did the semi-finals of the of the Aussie Open, which was a good start back for our partnership um, with with Bruno. And then since then, actually, it's been pretty, pretty rubbish. Um, Bruno was injured a bit when we did play. Neither has really played that well. Um, Bruno has been struggling a bit with the bubble as well. Um, he actually went home after Queens for a week just to get back home, see his family, kind of have a bit of normal life, and then he's coming back to Wimbledon on. On Friday, um, so it's been it's not not been easy the last few months, but um, you know it was really nice to win my match today. I was playing with another British guy, Luke Bambridge, so it's good to kind of enjoy that different different energies and stuff. But you know, Wimbledon is is Wimbledon, and you know, been preparing as best. Well, I've been preparing as best I can the last the last few weeks in the build up to that, and you know, hopefully when we get there, we're ready to to compete, ready to perform, and try our try our best to have a have a great run. And I'm interested in preparation. Um, how much do you prepare together and how much do you prepare apart, you and Bruno? Yeah, I mean, when we're not at tournaments, I mean, we don't, like, Bruno will go home to Brazil um, and I'll, I'll, be based in, I'll be based in London. So we don't really do much sort of practice weeks or training weeks together, more just kind of come together at the, at the tournaments and do our, do our prep there and, and, and get on the match court and compete. But um that's kind of how it is for most teams to be honest because you know we, we travel so much through the year anyway um it's quite nice to sort of get time off to yourself because it's pretty intense relationship when you are together um on the tour just because you spend so much of your day together you're always on the same schedules um so i think in terms of like longevity and stuff the relationship is probably quite good that we we don't see each other on our on our off weeks Good. I saw the seedings had just come out. Um, are you happy with your seeding? Uh, I think we I think we got seeded seven. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we were seeded seven. I think the other two Grand Slams, the rankings haven't really moved that much this year, just because people are kind of um, the sort of COVID protection that everyone's got. You, you're not really losing all your ranking points up, so there's not that much movement in the rankings. So even though we haven't done particularly well last few months it hasn't really cost us that much in terms of ranking spots that'll probably change towards the end of the year um, and then obviously into next year hopefully back to back to normal but um, I mean we're one of the best teams like you know we've, we've won big tournaments before Grand Slams Master Series and stuff so you know we know when we when we get out there and we compete hard and and perform to the level we can and we're, we're definitely one of the best teams um, but obviously that doesn't you know, it doesn't guarantee us having a great tournament or, or lifting a title or anything like that. What would a good Wimbledon look like to you? Um, well, I mean, obviously want to win. I mean, that's uh, that'll be my biggest goal until I stop playing. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, for me, just now is more, feel like I just want to feel good on the court again. Feel like I'm competing well, and you know my performance level is where it's at. Um, and if by that, then I don't see why we can't have a can't have a good run. Obviously, I'd love to win it. That's my that's my goal. Like I said, but you know that's not always in your um, 
in your control, unfortunately. And if you've got winning Wimbledon in your sights, what what other ambitions have you got for the year? Um, I think I think for us, just like get the partnership back on track, get our performance levels where they need to be to com- be competing at this at this level on the tour week in week out. And we know if we do that, we'll we'll win a lot of matches because we have done that in the past when we played for three and a half years before. Um, obviously the level's very high and stuff and you know you've got to be ready to compete each day each and every match um but yeah i mean for me it's just every time step on the court just try to win like that's what it's that's what it's all about and for me it's exciting that i know that i'm at a level where if i do perform well my level is good enough to go out and win lots of matches so that that's exciting but obviously when you are on a bad run it kind of <laughs> gets to you a bit I'm sure. And uh, who, who else should we be watching out for as you know um, potential winners of the, the the men's, the women's, and the um, the men's? Well, perhaps? I think like I mean, Djokovic obviously will be huge favourite, especially as Rafa's not um, not competing. Um, you know, he he showed like what an amazing player he is at the French Open just the last couple of weeks, um, and on grass he's probably more dominant than you would maybe expect on on clay so you know i'd be i'd be surprised if he didn't win the tournament to be honest um but you know there are obviously a lot of younger players coming through um who have you know who have beaten those those toys a bit more over the last couple of years but you know in a slam is is uh is very different and i think for the girl for the girls like i mean i always love watching ash barty play because she's so skillful and she plays so different to so many of the of the girls where it's kind of just feels like it's sort of stand stand on the baseline swing hard and and see what happens but she's got a totally different way of of playing her her set so unique on the on the women's game I think she's been struggling a bit with her with her back I don't think she's played any warm-up tournaments before Wimbledon um so be interesting to see how she goes but you know, if she plays well for me, she's she's probably favourite to 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 win. Yeah, I think I think that's what I think I read that. The um, what about up and coming stars? We should perhaps look out for anybody you think might make an impression on us this year. Um, it's so tough, like the because the top guys have like dominated these tournaments for so long, and it's so tough to beat them over five sets. Um. It's difficult to kind of see someone sort of random coming through the coming through the field. Um, I mean, you've got guys like like the Canadian boys, like Shapovalov and Felix Ogier Aliassime. Like they're capable of, of big results. Whether they could do it for five six matches, that's that's not been done yet. And then you start talking about guys like Zverev and Medvedev. Team, but team, he obviously. Um, he obviously, I think he hurt his wrist today in Mallorca, so I think he's now a doubt for, for that. Uh, and the thing is now, like the surfaces are so generic that, you know, it's not there aren't necessarily like grass court specialists anymore that you could see coming in and doing damage and beating top players. Like the surface changed so much now that you know you see the clay court are still doing well, hardcore players doing well on, on grass. Um, you know, Sarah Volley's gone out of the game loads um but i mean it'd be nice to see federer come through but he's not exactly a young up and cover yeah but is the ladies game more open yeah i mean it has been just over the last like five to eight years you've seen like how many different women have won grand slams and nobody's really kind of come out and and dominated um there's been loads of first-time winners. Um, I think the Canadian girl, Andreescu, she was looking like she was kind of ready to step up and sort of really be at the top of the game for a long time, but she's had terrible injuries. Um, I saw her today playing, actually. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how how she goes. But, you know, it's a lot of... The level's so high now, and there's so many of them kind of all sort of, you know, can win on, on their day, like Halep or Muguruza. Um, Azarenka's coming back in form as well um, so it is, it'd be, for me it'd be really difficult to pick 
pick a winner. But like I said, I like I do like Barty. I always root for her because I like the way she plays. Good. I've been asked on chat um, about the Brian brothers' retirement, and were you surprised? No, because I mean they're they're uh, forty two now. I think maybe forty one or forty two, uh, and they've been playing a long time. I think um, I think Mike was probably happy to keep playing, but I think Bob was felt like he'd kind of had it had enough. Um, but I guess, like, for them, I mean, they won everything. I mean, absolutely everything. <laughs> they won all the Masters, all the Slams, Olympics, um, Davis Cup. Like, they did it all. And I guess for them, what was left to what was left to, to achieve, I guess. But they obviously, the thing with them is, like, they loved, they loved competing. Like, that was, their, that was their thing. It was such an incredible effort from them to be you know, the top team for so long because basically every time you step on the court, like whoever you're playing is like desperate to beat you because you're number one and you're the top, the top dogs. And to stay at number one for so long, that like, was just incredible to me. Yeah, remarkable stuff. How's Andy's form at the moment? Well, I mean, no form really. I mean, he has barely played. Or he obviously he played at Queen's last that, week. Uh -huh. Say that again? Maybe is he is he fit now? I, 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 yeah. Well, I think he's it's difficult difficult to say. I mean, he's had so many sort of ups and downs with it, niggling injuries, and times where he's where he's felt um, where he's felt good and wanted to obviously get back on court and and compete, and then had another sort of unfortunate experience. But for me, he just needs you know a clear run at it where he gets you know a run of tournaments and. Can you know build up his match fitness, build up his form, get a clear sort of idea of where his levels are and what he needs to do to to um, to try and get back to the top. It's just been so difficult for him over the last few years because it's just been so so stop start with the injuries and then uh, again as he was about to come back, then COVID hit and there was like a six month break and you know so played it played at US Open and kind of had more injury problems after that and it's been a shame like a real shame because his tennis level is still there it's just that right now his body's just not letting him get out there and, and compete which is obviously hugely frustrating for him it wouldn't seem fair not to ask about the other mother, Murray brother and whether he's found a sport that his talents are talents <laughs> are <included to. laughs> that's brilliant that because I, when it when it when they first came up with the character and stuff I, I was away traveling i wasn't like on top of it at all and mum actually didn't mention anything to me and then kind of as was at tournaments like there's always Scottish people at the tournaments they come and support and stuff and you know they would start to sort of ask about Duncan and I was a bit like you know what what are you talking about <laughs> and then obviously I like, spoke to my mum and I started to see more stuff on social media but then I would get people writing to me on social media saying you know you know, we thought you were good guys. I don't know how you can treat your your brother like this or your other sibling, like blah blah blah. And I'm thinking, like, <laughs> talking about it. it's just me and Andy here. But they, but a lot of people believe that this was actually a was actually a reality. Um, but he, he he's a good guy. It's been uh, it's it's funny how his how his characters how his characters developed over the last sort of couple of years or so. Yeah. So we're, we can expect some more appearances, can we? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, at least we've cleared that one up. Um, so back, back to doubles, what, what makes a great partnership? I mean, you've had, you know, you, you, you've had a few, I suppose. Yeah. I've had, a, I mean, I've had a lot of partners in my, in my career, as most players do. Um, you know, my, my sort of long-term relationships if you like was with, was with John Pierce I played with him for three years so 2013 to 15 and then I played with Bruno three and a half years and then I played with Neil Skupski for a year and a half and now back with Bruno um, I mean for me different things I guess but you know I think it's important that you enjoy spending time with that person because I touched on here like you spend so much time with that person and you're you basically you know, you're on the same schedule, so you're waking up at the same time, you're going for breakfast, you're going for lunch, you're going to the courts together, you're warming up together, you 
practicing together, you know, shower together. And then it's like, okay, then you've done all that. And then you've still got to go play a match, which is like super stressful environment. And it's a lot, um, it's a lot easier to go through those sort of difficult moments. If you have that personal relationship, I think easier to work through, through problems and stuff like that. Um, so I think the personal relationship is really, really important. And then in terms of like performance side of things, like, Again, I think it's really important to have like a good team energy, good communication. Um, and, you know, you want to find someone who matches or complements your, your game style and you feel like can get the best out of you. And you obviously want to get the best out of that, that person because ultimately, you know, you could be two great players, but if there's no like cohesion or that, you're unlikely to be a very good, uh, successful team. And does the coach have a, an extra role to play in sort of managing the relationship or helping that along? Yeah, so, I mean, it's, I guess, like, every partnership or team is different. Like, some guys share a coach, which I would say probably makes sense. A lot of guys have their own coaches, and then there's sort of four of you in the team kind of trying to figure out the sort of best plan of attack for, for you guys. Um so it's tough. I mean, I, I would say it's hardest when, you know, if I come together with Bruno and I've got my coach and he doesn't have a coach and, you know, my coach is trying to sort of, you know, run the team and stuff when I, it's, you know, he's employed by me and whatever. It's, it, it's, it, I never feel like that really works. And, you know, all players are different and everyone's got their own way of seeing things and the way they like to do things and the way they see the game and how they, you know, feel like they should be, what they should be doing out there and what their partners should be doing out there um, on the court. It's not, it's not a difficult thing to sort of manage and, and organise. Um, but I think probably most successful teams, probably the ones that have kind of seen the game the same way and sort of understood like, okay, there's my game, my partner's game, but actually the most important thing is the, is the team um, and how you kind of both come together to create the best, strongest team you, you can each and every time you step up. So what's the setup you and Bruno have then? Do you have individual coaches or do you share one? We, we've, got, we've got individual coaches, like both like long-term coaches. Um, I mean, I've been with Al McDonald for for a long time um he probably started helping me sort of on and off when I was like 17 18 um and Bruno's had his coach Hugo for a long long time as well but they get on really well and stuff which which helps um and then actually like Louis Kaye who you know has coached me loads over the years but he now is more sort of he's more with the with the federation um but he kind of like oversees what we're what we're doing and stuff which is which is uh, which is pretty good. So we we've got we've got a good setup. I think we're pretty fortunate in that in that regard, and um, I think we all respect each other, all get on really well, which um, which really helps. So you've won seven Grand Slam titles. Which which do you consider your best achievement, and, um, and why? I think, I mean, the two men slams that I won. Like, especially Australian Open, I'd lost the two previous Grand Slam finals. So I'd lost Wimbledon final 2015. I'd lost US Open final 2015. And then Aussie Open 2016, I'd just started playing with Bruno. And, you know, it was only our third tournament together. Um, and, we, and we won, like, and we had a great run. We got through, like, a lot of, you know, we're in a lot of battles over the course of the fortnight. And, you know, we got through some really, some really sticky matches. And, um, played a great semi-final and then obviously going into the final again it's like you know got to win this one got to find a way because you know it's not like you get into a Grand Slam final every day and I had no idea if I'd ever get that opportunity again and you don't obviously want to let those those opportunities slip by um, I'd obviously seen what Andy had gone through as well because he I think he lost his first five I think Um uh, you know, he was a far better player than than I was, and there's no guarantee. Like I said, I was going to get back to have that opportunity again. So, uh, you know, fortunately, we were able to get through. And then in the U.S. Open later that year, we we won again. 
Um, and we finished number one that year as a as a team, which was which was awesome because it was our first year together, and we both come together because we both had pretty much won at every other level, but we neither of us had won a Grand Slam, and that was like the main goal for us was to to try to to try to to win one of those tournaments, and in our first year, we managed to win two. And, and what's your biggest high being in tennis? Or uh, I mean, individually, it was probably winning either of those Grand Slams. Um, I mean, Davis Cup as a team in, in uh, 2015, 2015 um, was, was a massive effort from the, from the team. I mean, especially Andy, because he won all his matches, um, had some amazing ties that we got to play that year. We played the other three Grand Slam nations, and then we played Belgium in the final. Like We got to play in Scotland um in glasgow twice um which was amazing for us like the atmosphere and the support and stuff we have was like incredible um and, and those will be the matches that i remember the most when i finished my career for sure just because of like the emotion and stuff um and yeah it was just like it was an amazing year for us and you know so many like just brilliant opportunities to go out and play in such special unique atmospheres and you know we have no live tennis in Scotland like this is crap so you know we never get the chance to come back and play in front of our own people um and like that year and, and we had obviously other other opportunities after that two or three times um but every time it's just been it's been amazing yeah the atmosphere at Glasgow was just Incredible. Yeah. That'd be great to repeat that. Yeah, I mean... Kind of thing again. And yeah. how do you enjoy competing with Andy? Oh, sorry. I interrupted you there. Well, you I mean, I love it. Like, atmosphere. in those... In, in, in Especially, like, in those matches, like, it's such a unique thing to do, to be able to compete at such high-level sport, represent your country with your brother. I mean, we're so privileged to be able to do that. Um, and... I mean, from a performance point of view, like, like for me, there's nothing to worry about because I know that he's been there and done that and he's not scared of those situations. And, um, you know, and also when we were playing, that, there was always a lot of pressure on us because especially that Davis Cup here, we basically had to win all the doubles matches. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone through because, unfortunately, at the time, our number two player wasn't quite strong enough to to get points against, you know, the other teams we were playing because, like, the nations we played were so were so tough. Um, and we knew, like, if we didn't win the doubles, but probably very unlikely we were going to go on to win any of the, any of the ties. Um, and we were really fortunate against America in the first round that uh, James Ward came back and beat Isner from two sets to love down, which was, like, you know, a crazy result. And... Um, you know, it was, was a massive, massive achievement for him to, to do that and, and to give the team a 2-0 lead um, going, going into, the, into the weekend. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it is, it's different. I mean, it's different because it's your brother. It's different because, you know, he's such an amazing player and, you know, they're always, they've got their own way of doing things. Um, you know, I, I would always say, like, they just because they play great singles doesn't always mean they play great doubles and it's a different game with different skill sets and it's not always easy to just step on the court and sort of really understand or or be up to the pace of it straight away because doubles is so much faster than than singles um and sometimes like we just take a bit of time to kind of get get used to it and figure out what's going to work well for us to to get back um you know, to, to, to get the right sort of strategy for us to, to play well. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a different dynamic when you throw in the fact it's your brother and the fact that it's like, you know, an amazing player there who's, who's done everything. Um, but, you know, I would never change that for the world. And if I was to go into battle for someone with, with someone from my life, I'd always choose Andy, you know. So you managed to put the sibling rivalry to one side for that, do you? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, we never really, after about 15, like, he was so much better than me. Um, well, certainly in singles. So never really, like, <laughs> that never really kind of materialised after uh, after that sort of age. But we get in some battles when we were younger because we were, we we're kind of the same level and we we're always traveling together and we were some of the best in our age groups. So we ended up like competing lots against each other. So we kind of just got used to it. But after Andy went off to Spain, when he was like 15, 16, then it kind of all, all changed after that. So how else does the sibling rivalry come out then at other times? Uh, I don't know. We've had some battles on the golf course in our times. Um, Fantasy football every year is pretty competitive. Um, but that's it. I mean, we're we're pretty relaxed off the court and stuff. I think, like, you know, we kind of put everything into what we're doing on the tennis court with, you know, competing or even it's just training and all that stuff. But, you know, once you're kind of off court and away from it, it's kind of like, okay, I need to settle down a bit. Because otherwise, like, it's just permanently intense your life, which I think... Um, you know, there's, I don't think there's many of us can kind of maintain that like 24 hours a day or whatever. No. Yeah. So the, the, the Davis Cup win, I think, was that first time in 79 years, which is a pretty incredible thing. Um, yeah, yeah. How did you celebrate? Um, I mean, we had a party back at the hotel, but we were in, in, in Ghent. You know, it was like Sunday night and stuff like They'd also there had just had um, uh, like a, uh, I don't know if it was, there was like a terror plot there. I don't know if it was in, in Ghent, but it was, or in, in Brussels, but Ghent had something to do with it, whether there was people involved there and stuff. So when we got there, like the city was kind of shut down. So it was a weird, it was a weird, um, a weird time, but, you know, we couldn't really do anything. We just, uh, we just went back to the hotel and, you know, the LTA had set up, uh, you know, the bar and everything for us. I mean, we'd kind of taken over the hotel anyway. So, and it was nice to spend it with, like, friends and family and stuff. Mm -hmm. Nothing too, uh, nothing too crazy, actually. Got to be, got to be honest. And that, that, that also um, led to the uh, sports personality or team sports yeah, personality yeah. team award that year. That must have been a big night, was it? <laughs> that was disappointing because we we basically it was in Northern Ireland and we I think that we flew over during the day and we were there for a few hours kind of at a hotel just kind of relaxing there was other kind of um, guests and stuff there that were going to the event kind of hung out with them a little bit and then went to the event and we actually flew back that night I don't know why we flew back that night but we but we did so kind of after the the ceremony and stuff and things were starting to to kick off we were we were out of there so that was a bit that was a bit disappointing actually Did you beat any of your sporting heroes um that night i, I met rory McElroy there actually um and a few other people I, was, well, it was obviously it was a big irish turnout because it was a big uh, it was a big deal for them over there um, I think that Northern Ireland football team had done really well that year, whether they qualified for like the Euros or something. Um, so we met we met their their squad. But as I said, like we kind of we were at the hotel, we got taken to the venue, into our seats, you know, did the ceremony, watched everything, and then um, basically like left. It was a bit yeah, as I said, it was, that was disappointing. I don't think we enjoyed that as much as we should have done. A little bit of an anti climax, but yeah. a great achievement nonetheless. Um, on uh, you know we've we, we've enjoyed all this great success in the in the UK recently. What what more do you think we need to be doing to you know help young help and nurture young talent? Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I mean, I think we've obviously struggled for a long time to sort of you know get numbers. I think um, you know to get numbers at you know even playing regularly on the on the tour or even lower down in, in challengers um i think british tennis obviously been incredibly fortunate that when tim retired basically andy started doing his thing and playing ended up playing at the top of the game for you know 15 years or so 
uh, and having so much success, which probably sort of papered over a lot of the a lot of the cracks. Um, but I mean, it's not easy. Like you see, I mean, a lot of the other Grand Slam nations are, are you know, they're struggling to to produce players. Um, personally, I don't feel like it should be the governing bodies remit to to produce you know world class players i think it's more to to grow the game and i think from our point of view like you know they, they obviously face a lot of competition now tennis as do you know, i'm sure football golf stuff like that, because there's so many more sports now that that can capture people's attention and um and give them interest and stuff so you know a lot more than there there used to be when certainly when when i was when i was growing up uh, which you know, I think is difficult. But I think for us, it's just doing the best we can to grow the pool, right? Because the bigger the numbers, the more chance there are of, of producing of, of producing top players. Which you know, you could say the same about Scotland, England, and in football. I think um, you know we're obviously a population of five six million, and England's sixty million. So it's natural that they have a lot bigger talent pool to to work from. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things often cited, I think, in, you know, about Scotland is the lack of indoor facilities because of the climate. Yeah. Um, is that something that would help? Yeah, I think or just more... England in a, or other... I think, I think probably the UK probably in, in general uh, but definitely in Scotland, I mean, the more facilities we have, the better, because the more opportunity for people to play tennis all year round, right? Um, I think that that obviously helps. And then obviously, you know, even things like the level of coaching that's that's on offer around the country. So my mum would always say, like, it doesn't matter if it's a crap facility, but if you've got a good coach in that area, players will come through from there. Um it's, she's more about people than, you know, what system is in place or facilities that they've got to they've got to work with, which, you know, makes sense because you know you have all these amazing players coming through from Eastern European countries, for example, Serbia and Croatia and places like this that you know they have no national centres, they have no government funding for their sports, but yet they have so many players coming through and making a career playing playing tennis um and a, and a lot of it probably comes down to like desire and, and hunger at the end of the day i mean we're you know we're living in a country where there's lots of opportunities for for people right whereas a lot of times where where these guys are coming from is sport is a way is a way out for them um and i think that i think that i think that i think that does have a lot to do with it is as well, we just have a lot more options, a lot more opportunities in our in our life. It's interesting with the point you make about people. You know, if you have good, strong local people, then you know that's more important than facilities. And it's only a little bit. Um, is it? Have we lost the technology? Have you got me? Uh, yeah, James? it came. It came back there. It was it was cutting off. So my Wi-Fi at this hotel is not um, not fantastic. I would say I just I just caught the end of that. Sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking. You know, there, it's an interesting point about people. You know, good local coaches being really important, and perhaps more than facilities. And I just thought about it the other way around. You know, you could have the best facilities if you don't have good people in the facilities. Then it's not good to help. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would totally agree. Like that's what my that that's what my, that's what my mum would say as well. You know, you can spend forty million on a national centre, but if you don't, you know, with all the bells and trimmings and all that stuff, but if you don't have the right people working there, you're never going to have players come through and and um, you know play it play at the top of the game or or at a you know professional level or or whatever, um, which. You know, obviously, the more I experience and stuff in our country, the more I start to sort of understand that. And your mum was obviously a driving force. What was it that got you hooked into the sport? Was it your mum or was it other things? Um, I think, I mean, to be honest, like we started playing tennis in Dunblane because my mum was like, the, she was the club coach at Dunblane 
and we would be round there when she was giving lessons to the older kids. That's how we started playing. Like we just, we, I guess at some point we were going to pick up a racket and start playing, but I guess like, you know, we were both good from a young age and I think kids obviously it's easier to keep going with something that you're, that you're good at. Right. And I'm sure that was the, that was the case for us, but we were obviously incredibly fortunate that we had our mum who, you know, one of the best development coaches in the world. And we had Stirling University 10 minutes from our house, which just opened indoor courts. Um, so we were incredibly fortunate with that. Some of the David Lloyd clubs had started to open as well through in Glasgow. So we would drive through there as well to, to, to play and play with other other kids our age and stuff. Uh, so we, I mean, we were, we were incredibly lucky with our set of conditions because then two of my best friends at the time, you know, one was living up in, well, one is from Elgin. So they had like nothing up there. So we had to drive or take the you know train. No, about over. that. That's, that's where I grew up. It's a terrible uh, yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it was a great place to grow up, but you're right. It's a little bit remote. Yeah, so he would have to come down to Stirling to to play if he wanted to play tennis in the winter. And my other friend was from St Andrews, and they would drive over, you know, an hour twenty, hour thirty to to Stirling Uni to to play tennis for two hours. And his his mum or dad would drive him drive him back. Like it's it's brutal, you know. We had which you know requires tremendous sacrifice from from obviously the players themselves, but the the parents and stuff who had to do it and. You know, we were very fortunate that we had all this kind of on our on our doorstep, um, which obviously had a massive, massive effect on our ability to sort of develop our skills and, you know, get, you know, the, the hours of tennis that we probably needed at that age to 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 develop to a level where we really wanted to go and take it seriously and start thinking about maybe this could be a career for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it does sound like the right combination of facilities and convenience and the right person at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking towards the Olympics. Um, will we be seeing you in Tokyo? No, I didn't get picked. Is that so right? They, yeah, it's not, I don't think it's been announced yet, but they, they, they had to do the selection yesterday. So, um, so I didn't make the team this year, which was, which was I mean, it was disappointing. Um but like I've been three times and never really had good experiences there, like tennis wise. Um, so, I, you know, I'm disappointed not to go, obviously, but I don't feel like it's the end of the world for me that I'm not going. I think uh, the fact that like been traveling so much the last sort of nine months and stuff in these bubbles and normally this time of year, you get to be at home for like five, six weeks because I live in Wimbledon. So I stay at home for, um, you know, Queens normally don't play Eastbourne to Wimbledon. And then afterwards, you know, have a week or, or two at home before going to the States. So this year, you know, I'm not at home, basically staying in these hotels. Um, so actually after Wimbledon, it'd be quite nice to have like two or three weeks at home and then go to the, the States for six or seven weeks and play all those those events um because otherwise you're pretty much going from Wimbledon to Tokyo back to the States and then I'm basically away the whole year and never see my wife which not great news I don't think no that must be that must be tough the uh what, what was it led to the poor experience at previous Olympics then well I mean just I think I think just performance I mean in in London I mean, in Beijing, me and Andy were young and, you know, it was our first first time going and, you know, we didn't really have many, that many expectations. Um, but it just, yeah, we didn't, didn't, didn't enjoy it. Um, and then in London, you know, we didn't really, we didn't have any Olympic experience. Well, I didn't have an Olympic experience. Obviously, Andy did win a gold medal, but, you know, we were staying at home at Wimbledon. They didn't want us to stay in the village because it was obviously all the way across town in Stratford, which is pretty much the worst possible place in London to, for, you know, to be based to go play Wimbledon. Um, so we were basically told to stay, a, stay at home, um, which is unique in itself in that, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, drive five minutes and compete at the Olympic Games. Um, 
and the, you know the match we played like this incredible atmosphere so it was so good like nothing like what Wimbledon normally is um uh, and it was you know it was it was crazy match but we ended up losing which was my fault and I didn't really didn't play well and, and was struggling generally with my tennis at that time uh, so obviously played the match lost and then that was it that was me that was me done so I didn't have like didn't have any experience at all of that Olympics other than like crushing disappointment of of playing crap and losing this match um, and then in Rio we were I mean I think we were both ranked like two in the world at the time and you know obviously had a you know Probably, I was probably playing the best tennis of my life around then and went to went to Rio, lost in the first round, close match, and was like 7-6, 7-6. But, you know, like Andy's obviously there, he's doing his singles. You know, there's, there's no preparation for the doubles. It's just, okay, we go on and we play. So I'm there myself doing my own preparation, which is not ideal for, you know, the Olympic Games, which comes around every four years. But obviously that's just that's just normal because you know singles is the is the priority. So we lost that, and um, you know I was really bummed out by that because I felt like we would have had a great chance to to potentially medal there. Um, and my coach actually walked off the off the match, and Louis he was so bummed out about it, and he's like he's like I promise you, he's like I'll do everything I can for you to win the U.S. Open. And two weeks later, we won the U.S. Open. So um kind of kind of made up for it and to be honest I'd rather have had the US Open I think than than the Olympics don't know why but maybe just because of how it worked out and um, the experiences that I had that um I I was so grateful for for that one thing good stuff um I'm about to kind of um start to look at the kind of uh, the questions that have come through okay um, I wonder if you could talk to us about the Battle of the Brits in Aberdeen and tell us a bit about that and whether there are still tickets and all that good stuff. Yeah, so we've got the Battle of the Brits, Scotland v England in December, December 21-22 at PNG Live uh, Arena in Aberdeen, which uh, we're super excited about. I mean, the reason for putting on the event, I mean, a few things really is... Um, from, I mean, from a purely selfish point of view, you know, we won the opportunity to play in Scotland and we're not getting any any younger. So um, those opportunities are few and far between. And, you know, there's no reason for there to ever be Davis Cup again there because of the way that the format's changed. Um, you know, we want to play in front of the, of the Scottish people and, you know, have the amazing experiences that we've had from, from Davis Cups. Um, and you know, I think give give the people something to look forward to after something that's, you know, been a really difficult time for so many, so many people. Um, and, you know, I think the whole sort of Scotland v England thing is, is pretty cool. I think the dynamic or the makeup of the players that we have right now, you know, we've got Andy and Cam Norrie for Scotland, Kyle and um, Dan Evans for, for England is like, is perfect for that matchup. And it'll be, you know, it'll be very, close match and um you know the boys will both you know everyone will want to beat each other you know um and you know hopefully we're able to play in front of you know six and a half thousand people each each session uh, we sold tickets really well at the at the start when they when they were announced it's kind of slowed down a bit now and we've released more more tickets but I'm, I'm hoping obviously once there's more sort of certainty around you know how many people can come to indoor events and that sort of stuff that you know ticket sales will 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 pick up again because obviously we still don't know exactly what um what the restrictions hopefully there aren't any restrictions um what they what they will be for the for hosting indoor events no you'd think it'd be an excellent event and you, you'd think the tickets would would sell out but it's great there are some of it availability now it'd be good to yeah pick some of those up i think yeah on that, yeah, yeah. Um, right, one, we've been asked two or three times about who you think are the greatest male and female players of all time. Um, well, I mean, it's a pretty interesting time in, in men's tennis just now because, um, especially after 
Djokovic won French Open because now um, Rafa and Roger on 20 and Novak's on 19, I think. So um, if I had to bet, I would bet that I would bet that Novak will probably finish above the other two, I think. I mean, I'd be very surprised if Federer won another Grand Slam. Um, Rafa, you know, could I see him winning another couple of French Opens? Probably. Um, but the other slams, I'm not so sure. Um, just because Novak is, has been so dominant on, on hard courts and Rafa doesn't seem to play Wimbledon anymore. So, um yeah, I, I'd I'd have to bet that Novak would 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 surpass both of both of them just on his superiority across all all surfaces. I think, and yeah. and the woman, I mean, I mean, I obviously never wasn't really around for the eras of like Chrissy Ever and Martina Navratilova, and I kind of, you know, my generation is is Serena Williams. Um, probably surprised that she hasn't got more Grand Slams, to be honest, given the dominance that she had for so long. Um, but, you know, will she get another Grand Slam? I, I, I don't know. It probably doesn't maybe look like it right now. Um, but, you know, if she was to win Wimbledon, no one, no one would, be, would be surprised. And I think if she, if she does win, I think, does she equal Margaret Court's record or she, or she goes one ahead of her? I can't, I can't remember, but... Um, yeah, I mean, like when I see, I mean, I was lucky enough actually to play in the Ratilova at the opening of the grass, uh, the indoor, uh, the roofs or court one at Wimbledon. That was pretty amazing. And I mean, she's six years old, but like she still plays amazingly well, and like her skills are off the charts. Like that must have been interesting. That yeah, yeah. No, it's good. The um, it's interesting that it sounds like we're watching the best players of all time right now. Um, we don't need to look to the past to pick them out. Yeah, well, I mean, they're they're comfortably ahead of everyone else. Um, when and obviously when Sampras got fourteen, I don't think people really thought that was going to be beaten. And then three guys from the same generation have have done it. Um, and it's just incredible the the dominance that they've that they've had and the levels that they've been able to <laughs> to reach. Um, Tennis wise, you know, physicality as well, like some of the five set matches and stuff that they've had and and how physical the game's gotten over the over the last like 15 years just is is remarkable, really. Um and you know, I mean, it's funny because when you know, probably like five, six, seven years ago, people were like, Well, there's a whole generation of players that just aren't you know, that are amazing players, guys like Nishikori, Berdich, Bavrinka ended up winning some, but, you know, guys who, they just never had a chance because these guys were so dominant. Then you thought, okay, you know, these next guys coming up, you know, they'll have the opportunity to maybe win six, seven, eight grand slams, but these guys have just kept going and going and they might get another whole generation of, of players who just don't win who just don't win slams because these guys will stay around maybe, you know, another three, four years potentially. And by then, you know, more younger ones have, have come up and these guys have missed their opportunity to, to make slams. I mean, guys like, I mean, who knows, guys like Zverev or Medvedev or, um, I don't know, someone like Shapovalov or someone like that. Like they might just, they might just miss the, miss the boat. Who knows? So one of the questions leading on from that is asking you to look into your crystal ball, I think, because we're being right. asked who might be the top three male players in five years' time? I mean, I mean, Djokovic could obviously easily still be there. Raf, I don't think so. I think he'll have stopped by then. He's my age, so in five years he'll be 40. I don't... I don't think he's still going at 40. Um, I mean, there's a young Italian guy now, Yannick Sinner, who is an incredible player and potentially better than a lot of, you know, your Zverevs and teams and these guys. I mean, he's only 19, I think, but he's already maybe top 25 in the world. And, you know, he's going to be top player for the next 10, 15 years as well, as long as he stays, stays healthy. 
Um, I imagine Zverev will, will, will be up there. He's been there for a long time already. And, he, you know, he's, he's very, very consistent. Um, team, I guess. But I guess five years is a long time, right? Like there's kids now who are 17, 18, we've never heard of. Five years time, they're, you know, 22, 23, and they're, they're, they're established. And yeah, but I guess like the rankings haven't changed much, right? For the last, you know, five, six, 10 years. I mean, the same sort of three, four, five guys that have always been, been at the top. So the days of somebody like uh, Becker rocking up age 17 and just winning, probably. Well, I, I, I'd find, I, I just think like the game's so much more physical now than what it was in the past. Um, you don't really see these young guys breaking through as early as that anymore, I don't think. Obviously, some do because they're just exceptional, but, um, you know, I think it takes, it takes longer to get yourself up there just because, well, yeah, the physicality is obviously like the development, physical development of the, the players and just like the guys are around there longer, you know, more experienced. I think the, the top hundred is the oldest it's it's ever been, just because guys, you know, they're able to stay around there longer because financial incentives are there and they obviously they know how to look after their bodies a lot better. So people aren't stopping at 30 when they used to. And now it's like 35, 36, 37. Um so for me I don't I struggle to see that that happening especially right now while like Raf and Djokovic are still right at the top because I just I don't see how any 17 year old could come and suddenly do those guys over five sets just I, I couldn't I just couldn't see, couldn't see it happening yeah seems pretty far-fetched yeah so we've talked about your career highlight uh, we've also been asked about your proudest career moment which I suppose could be different or is it the same thing um I think I mean proudest probably. I think probably just like probably some of those Davis Cup matches where, um, like we just had this like incredible support from the fans and being able to to go out there and perform the level that we needed to and to get the point for the for the team that we give us a lead going into into Sunday like that was. Yeah, I think I'm proud of the way that I was able to kind of handle those situation stuff because it's not, um, it's yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. I don't think. Um, yeah, so probably probably some of those Davis Cup matches in Scotland, the one against France as well that we won at Queens, like to beat Songa and and Mahu. Um, that was that was huge. That was a huge win for for us, and um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on on that day because. We really felt like if we got through that tie, we were probably the best team left in it from the semi-finals onwards, just because we had Andy and he was by far the best player that was that was um, in the competition still, and we had a great doubles team and me and me and Andy we we didn't have to play like we'd already beaten the states we didn't have to come up against the Bryans or really experienced established team it was a lot of you know, singles guys coming in to play the doubles matches and stuff. And, you know, I, I felt confident that, you know, we had the level to to beat those guys. So that was that was a proud moment to get get through that match the way we did against the kind of calibre of, of opposition. There was a question that was texted in by Richie Ramsey. I'm not sure uh, he yeah. at the moment. He's not on the call, but um, he was asking about uh, nature and nurture and which part played the most in your success. Um, I think nurture just because you know we you know we had our mum who was you know this incredible coach and was able to give us the necessary or teach us the necessary skills and give us the tools that we needed to give us the best opportunity of you know developing into you know maybe not professional players I'm sure she didn't think that when we first started playing tennis and stuff but you know to at least give us a chance to you know progress with our with our tennis and um you know she obviously 
made some huge sacrifices for us growing up. Like, you know, she didn't, like she would say, like, she's, I didn't know how to, what I was doing or how, you know, what were the right decisions to make at certain points in your careers. But, you know, she wasn't afraid to ask people and try to kind of gather information and speak to people who've maybe been there at that stage or have experience of where we were in that, in that moment and try to kind of figure out that way, which I think is incredibly difficult for a lot of, um, for a lot of parents, because why would you, why would you know how to develop your 10 year old kid who's showing a bit of promise into, you know, professional athlete in, in 10 years time, like who, why should you know that? And, you know, it's, it's, it's very, I think it's very difficult for, for parents, but she, you know, she, she did the best job she could. And, you know, she was amazing at creating opportunities, not just for us, but for so many kids, um, Scottish kids in, in, in tennis, um, you know, and she's still doing that today. Like it's, it's, it's amazing. Like she's amazing amazing woman and been an amazing mum for for us yeah. and how did you react to her going on strictly <laughs> um, that was that was tough um because she was hopeless but we uh i mean she loved it like she loved the experience and me and my wife went to to watch her one one week and uh, she i mean she did really good like the, the week is it's funny how they kind of do the show because um she said a lot of times like you're based your performances are actually based on your um uh sort of dummy run that you do either in the morning or the day before where you have to go out and you get to practice but the judges are watching so they've seen what you can do but obviously on t on the live show you know they've only got like two or three minutes and they're they're watching whatever so she says sometimes if you do a bad dummy run you'll get stiffed for the for the main event not that she was claiming she was a great dancer or anything like that. She was, wasn't her, her forte, but uh, she loved the experience. Like, and, and she, I think it really kind of helped her with a lot of things that she wanted to do after, after that. Um, and yeah, I think it was a great experience for her. I just, yeah, it was a, t- <laughs> it was a tough watch seeing your mum out there. <laughs> Very good. The, uh, it just occurred to me when when you were growing up. I mean, obviously, tennis was the thing that um, you stuck with. But did you play other sports? I mean, could you have been a professional footballer or golfer? Were there other things that you were playing at the same time? I mean, I played loads of golf growing up. Like that was a huge, huge passion of mine. Um, you know, my dad taught me to play. My grandparents probably from was about seven or eight years old. Um, and I mean, in Dunblane, like the tennis clubs next door to the golf course so you know we lived like one minute walk from from them so we would go over and you know play tennis go back home get a bit of food in the summer then come back in the evening play like 18 holes of golf almost um and I mean I I loved it it's a great great sport played you know I played a lot of football growing up as well not really for teams and stuff but played a lot like five aside stuff and our parents were always very much like you know, they, they didn't really want us to just be like tennis, 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 and that's it. You know, they wanted us to try lots of different sports and, you know, we enjoyed, they would encourage us to, to keep doing. It just happened that, you know, tennis was where we really sort of excelled. And for us, like, there was a the motivation to really keep going with that and stick in and, and make the sacrifices and stuff. Whereas even though I love my golf and was competitive with it, it was more just a hobby but I, I would never claim that I could could have been a professional golfer far are from you, it are you claiming any credit for Callum Davidson 62 I know I know I mean he's a joke man I mean he I've played golf a few times like he's he's off the charts like I mean he obviously he genuinely could have been a professional golfer and he was on like um I think Scotland squads are like the, the, the county squads that he was in, but, you know, there's two or three guys that were in his group that obviously went on to, you know, be career, um, be professional golfers on the European tour. Um, and for him, like it genuinely was, okay, do I go down the golf route or do I go down football? He obviously chose 
chose football, but I mean his his level of golf is insane. But he didn't win the club championships though. No, didn't win. No, that was the qualifying course. That was a new course record he got. But he, uh, I think he lost in the in the quarterfinals. I think. Okay, no, that was quite yeah. amusing when I read that. Um, we've been asked about the best coach you've had and why. You might have answered that already, perhaps, given um, the relationship you've got with your current coach. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, my mum was obviously an amazing coach for us growing up and, you know, the best person we could have possibly had. Um, and then, like, Louis Caille, who I started working with in 2006, because my mum had seen him at Monte Carlo Masters um, coaching uh, coaching these two Israeli guys who just won the Australian Open. And my mum was like, kind of like mesmerised by all the, the coaching that he was doing. It was so specific to doubles, which is so hard to find. Um, and myself and Colin Fleming uh, from Linlithgow, we were playing together at the time and we were, I mean, we were 20 years old, Colin was a couple of years older than me. And we were sort of like about 150 in the world and we we're, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd done really well in the Futures Tour. We we're starting to do well in the Challengers Tour. And for me, it was like, that's the route I wanted to go down because that's how I saw myself being able to make a career from, from tennis and have the opportunity to maybe play some of the bigger tournaments um, and try to kind of, make a life on on the on the main tour um and you know again like she she wanted to help us in any way she could and put us surround us with the right people and she saw louis and she asked him and we were in, we were incredibly lucky because he had met a english woman when he was in england doing coaches conference and he was actually moving to london to live from from canada um, and obviously he didn't know anyone in, in London or UK and didn't have anything lined up and stuff. And so we were able to spend the sort of grass court season with him. It was the first year that we played Wimbledon. Um, and we got sort of like five, six weeks as all my mum could afford to um, employ him for, um, which was which was amazing for us. And like the level of knowledge and stuff that he, he has is just amazing. Um, not just tennis, but just in coaching and teaching and life and stuff. It's, it's amazing. And even still today, like I've been with him for, you know, 15 years, but still, still teaches me so much and still love being around him and his, his company and stuff. So um, he's definitely, definitely the best coach I've had in, in my career. I don't see how anyone will top that, especially now age 35, you know. Excellent. The, uh, we've been asked about prospect uh, or the prospects for Jack Draper, and if you've seen much of Jack, and um, you know, could he be a, a great British hope? Yeah, I think so. I think he probably can. Um, he, you know, if, is he going to have a career like Andy? That's, you know, that's unlikely just because of the career that Andy's had. Um, but you know, can he? go play the tour for 10, 15 years. Yeah, he probably can do that. And he's got he's got a lot of game, a lot of um a lot of power. He's a big, big guy, lefty as well. There's so few lefties as well um playing these days. I don't know why. Um but that's so that's an advantage in itself. Um you know he seems like a nice kid and likes putting the work in and stuff. So um you know I think he'll go on to have a to have a good career difficult for me to say to what extent really um but you know i think the next couple of years will be pretty interesting to see how he how he develops further because he's only 19 i think um so it'd be pretty i would say probably important years for him but hopefully you know last week at queens was huge for him to get um to get those wins you know against you know top players but also just in that environment and stuff as well um you know, so it'll be interesting to see how he pushes on over the next couple of years and hopefully can establish himself inside the top 100. Excellent. We've been asked, Jerry Kelly has asked us about uh, any top tips for club level doubles players? Uh, top tips? 
I mean, a lob, I always think a lob is so important in club doubles because people aren't always, like, they don't often have, like, the athleticism of the of the pros. So a lot of times balls will get over your over your head that pro would be able to, you know, get back and, and smash. I always, I always think that. I think, um, I always say to people, like, the less you do with the volley, the better. So, you know, if the ball's coming fast, don't be taking, like, big swings or anything like that. And it's easier to aim at a target that's just in front of you. So me, like when I volley, I almost always try to volley at the net tape, at the net strap, rather than like try to volley on the baseline because then you're likely to, you know, lift the ball because you're hitting it to a further, a, a further away target. Um, but also just find someone that you like playing with, right? Because you know, you're playing for fun because you enjoy it, it's your hobby. Don't play with someone you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a good tip. Yeah. Um, the, we've been asked so, uh, about the new Davis Cup format that I'm completely unaware of. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, what you think of that and will you be playing in future GB matches? Well, I hope so. If, uh, but that's that's not always up to me. That's up to the captain to pick me. Uh, I mean, the new... The new format basically is the finals. You know, it's, uh, well, we played in Madrid in 2019. That was the first year they changed the format. So you had like, I think it was 12 teams. So it was like four groups of three that they had um, in Madrid. And then this year it's been extended. I don't know if it's maybe 16 teams. I'm not sure. But they play the group stages in three different cities and then everyone comes together to play the finals in Madrid. Um, I mean, you obviously lose the home and away ties, which, you know, most people would say like that is Davis Cup. That's what it's all about. Um, and if you suddenly put it in, you know, two random countries playing together, playing against each other in another random country, how are you going to get the same atmospheres, which, I would agree that's tough to tough to recreate. Um, I also don't see how it's sustainable with like the amount of money that they're putting into it. How long that can that can last? Because I don't, you know, if 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 it continues like it was the first year, they're losing millions and millions and millions of pounds because there's just not enough people going to going to watch it. Basically, and you know, they were very lucky that. Well, I guess they got what they wanted. They, they, the finals were in Madrid and they got Rafa to play for Spain and Spain ended up winning. And obviously when Spain were playing, it was amazing atmospheres. But, you know, there was a lot of matches where there just wasn't anybody there, which, you know, it's not what Davis Cup's about. So it definitely remains to be seen whether it can be successful or not. Good. We're um, conscious of time, so I'm just probably going to ask you one Last question, which um, I think we've got through most questions. So apologies to any we I've missed. But um, it's do you, do you start thinking what comes after tennis, or is that for another day? Have you got plans beyond tennis? No, no. I, I start to think about that. I think um, you know, as you get older, you realise like your career is going to finish at some point. You start to kind of have more and more thoughts about that. Um, you know, we did the Battle of the Brits events last year, which by all accounts, seemed to go really well and had a lot of nice feedback about that. Um, and I think that's something that interests me to do to do more events. Um, I definitely would like to do more events in Scotland just because, you know, we do have no live tennis, as I said, and I think a way to increase interest and awareness and inspire people to play play tennis or or that or another sport is to have you know, live competition of that sport in your in your country um, where people are able to come down and, and witness it firsthand. So I think um, I, I would like to to do more of that. And obviously the event in Aberdeen is a big step up for us because it's the first time we're doing it where there's actually fans and selling tickets and all this stuff. And there's so much more that goes into it. So it's a huge, it's a huge learning, learning curve for me. But, um, you know, that's definitely something that, that interests me. And you know, trying to help where I can with some of the younger Scottish Scottish kids because there's not many people in our country that have 
you know gone through the journey and got to the very top and um i think like it's important to to help the players and help the coaches to you know just increase our chances of having more kids that you know playing the game at a better at a better level i think okay that's been uh that's been really insightful jamie thank you for uh for joining us i've certainly that's really all right. and there's some great comments of i've noticed coming through the chat of people appreciating um what you've done and how inspiring they've found the the the, the evening so um you know really everybody appreciates it and thank you very much we wish you all the best for wimbledon hope yeah you, uh, thanks a lot hope you do well we'll all fingers be fingers crossed we'll uh, be rooting for you that's for sure i um, uh, appreciate it so yeah i hope that all works out well i'm just going to say one last thing our next to just to let the, the, the people know who are on our next webinar is on the 28th of July and it's with uh, the rugby greats Paul O'Connell um, you know who you'll know from Lions fame and Bob Skidstat the ex South African captain so um, we'll have them on talking about just between the first and the second test talking about how the first test went and how the second test might go and um, and, and that should be an exciting evening as well so um, look out for that invitation or get online and subscribe. That would be great. So thank you, Jamie. I'll see you uh, Thanks for having me. you get back to some, some R&R. Yeah, get my dinner now. Okay, Jamie, enjoy. Right. See you guys. Thanks for having me. All the best. Thank Cheers. You. Thank Bye. you.